Hi Thiel, how are you today? I'm good, how about you? Great, fantastic. So uh, my name is Alejico. So I started recently a Thiel Tribe meetup group in Silicon Valley near San Francisco. And I have the pleasure to welcome you today. And you're known as a spiritual uh, catalyst. So if you're watching this video, you probably know already all about Thiel, her unique life journey, extrasensory abilities. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this topic, but if you're not too familiar with her and her teaching, please visit www.tilswan.com. So my own spiritual search started when I was a young man. So it's been an intense, sometimes difficult, but very rewarding journey. So I met Till on YouTube about 18 months ago, and I'm very grateful that I was able to establish a connection with you, Till, as you've touched my life already in a very deep and meaningful way. So today, we will focus on the concept of intentional communities. So there are a few reasons why this is a topic dear to my heart. First, from age 20 to 23, I was involved with a spiritual group that I left after realizing it was a cult. So though this cult was not as extreme as yours, Till, uh, which was a blood covenant, I can say I, can under I understand cults from the inside, why people join, and what it takes to deprogram yourself and heal from the experience. So from 2002 to 2007, I built a non-profit organization that became the largest French-speaking professional group in the Silicon Valley with 2,000 members. And then over the last seven years, I built a software company with a unique culture mm -hmm. that fostered professional and personal growth. So a few weeks ago, I decided it was time for me to support you, Till, and your vision on intentional communities. So the first step was the creation of a local uh, Till Tribe Meetup group in Silicon Valley in preparation of your uh, workshop in San Francisco early April. Synchronization workshop will take place on uh, Saturday, April 1st. So if you'd like to be part of this journey, please search Till Tribe Meetup in Silicon Valley. So now, of course, I'm going to let you speak. But uh, first, Till, what I want to ask you how did this concept of Teal Tribe come about? Actually, the concept of Teal Tribe um, was a spin-off of um, a friend of ours, kind of a friend, he's like a business colleague at first, who was named Joseph Zenner. And he created this group called the Love of Teal Swan Society, then it was Teal Scott Society. And he started coining the term Tealers. And it was like a, a really nice way, I guess, to sum up people who follow my material. That was just the idea. And I was in the process of still trying to sort of merge these worlds between uh, what I want to see happen in the world in terms of people getting together and connecting, but also wanting to develop my brand identity because, I, of course, my whole vision on this planet is going to ride on me becoming very well known. So... Uh, I decided to keep the name Teal and then put Tribe after it because I was trying to figure out like a way to word group or um, collective or whatever that I liked. And I liked the word Tribe because instead of it being like a family or something like that, it's a group of people who may or may not be related that resonate enough with each other to become like a family, which is what I think most of us are missing. In, in fact, it's very interesting because and we've seen that in the spiritual content Many people regret the time of the tribe where we were all supporting each other. Now, mostly society is very anonymous. So, tell me more about the core issues uh, you see in the society today uh, that intentional communities are attempting to solve. Um, well, for one, like homelessness wouldn't exist. <laughs> There wouldn't be these holes that you see in society where if somebody doesn't have an immediate family or doesn't have another support group that they're just going to fall through the cracks of the system and have nowhere to belong. Um, community really takes care of its own and it's one of the main reasons why people even belong to church groups. It's actually kind of funny but the studies that have been done on why people actually go to churches has very little to do with their actual beliefs and much more to do with a sense of community. Yeah, some, so, some people go there to date. 
pretty much or, <laughs> or like have support yes and the, the reality is, is like if you all you need to do to see the how valid it is to have a community is to like have a newborn and see how hard that is by yourself or have somebody get sick and see how hard that is by yourself or else have something exciting happen and realize that you're in the room by yourself you know <laughs> We are all about the shared experience. And so when we're going through times of positivity, we want to share that positivity. When we're going through times of pain, we want unconditional presence so that we have somebody to go through that with. So we are not designed to be alone as yeah. a species at all. So how did we manifest this isolation that we see today in society, where at a the time there was very close community and tribe, now we are society, we are all divided and... Uh, and we are really isolated from one another. Property. Property, unfortunately, is the answer. I mean, the second that you consider the ownership of something, then it, it's about what's mine and what's yours. And so that's when that sort of imaginary fence gets set up. Yeah, I love the saying of Native American. They were very surprised when they heard the, 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 the people that were colonizing their land say that they believe they own property because from their perspective, uh, land were owning them, so it, it was very, very interesting. And and this concept of property came about uh, some deep fear, I would imagine. Uh, what did you? Which fear was at the base of this creation of property? Scarcity. Yeah. The minute that humanity got into a scarcity type of a thinking, they started to concern themselves with giving to somebody else takes from me. Yeah. And then you know, property. That's a property is linked to identity as well. The loss of self me and mine is still a part of my identity and so now I, I need that to continue this is actually what births the single family household if I need what's me and mine to continue past me dying I need progeny because having kids is the only way that I can then guarantee my own survival mm. but now that became what kids are mine what kids aren't mine then then marriage happened that was actually the birth of marriage huh. this female belongs to me and thus these children are mine and thus they're going to get what's mine, and these people aren't. Now I have to defend it with guns, right? And so it just started whittling down and whittling down to the point where now, um, and also you watched society evolve to the degree that it became easier for people to survive based on what governments were feeding them instead of their small tribal communities. Um, <laughs> once that progressed, it, be, it didn't become necessary anymore to involve your extended relatives, which used to be, it's sort of like we just started whittling it down, right? So first mm -hmm. we've got our community. Now we've got just our relatives and extended relatives. Now we've just got immediate relatives. That was the birth of the single family household. And it's getting whittled down even worse nowadays because a lot of people can provide a lifestyle for themselves because of the way our society runs without involving anyone. Yeah. You know? And that's just on a physical level though. That's my major issue. Even though in today's world, if it keeps going the way that it's going, you can physically support yourself as an individual person. You can't do it emotionally. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we can see, I mean, the United States is by far the wealthiest country in the world, but we're not the happiest people, uh, and, and by far, because I, th I think even in the history of humanity, there was a shift probably from the heart to the mind, and the mind is afraid of the future, and that's you write that created property materialism. I, uh, I see now we have such a need to accumulate in this society because of fear. We are uh, fear of, uh, of getting old, so we need uh, health care. We have fear that our kids won't take care of themselves because of education going up. So, it, and it's never enough. Uh, 1 million, 10 million, 100 million. You, we always need to uh, accumulate. And when I think if we were to have really true authentic relationship, the happiness would be so much more simple to reach. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we have to stop the right race and, uh, and really understand from the inside that it's all based on fear, really. And uh, so now let's speak about meaning. We see many young people in the world today and, and we live in an extremely uh, complex world. Uh, we see, we've never seen so much depression. I think people can't find really meaning into their life and, and their relationship. Uh, uh, how can intentional communities fix that? Well, God. I mean, 
the thing about intentional communities that, that I think is great on a physical level is that it's like a mini version of society. So if you've got a person in the family that's good at math, then they're the ones doing math. If you've got a person in the family that's good at cooking, then they're the ones doing the cooking. And so it, you're not like struggling to do everything, which is the problem that we've got, especially, and I can speak to this especially as uh, women, you know, women in today's world are the ones mm. that are taking the biggest hit because yeah. it's like there is no way to get all the bills done to keep going to a nine to five job, to parent the children, to make sure the kids' homework is done, to drive them there, to go to parent teacher conferences, to make sure the car insurance is done. So you see, like even that's just a tip of the iceberg, and I'm already at a point, you know, where you're like, I can't do it. No, exactly. Yeah, I feel that with so many women, especially at work, they feel they can never win. Yeah, and that's not how it's supposed to be. Because we're not supposed to be the only one raising the children. We're not supposed to be the only one cooking. We're not supposed to be the only one doing that. And so when you start into an intentional community like I have done, it just becomes this immense amount of relief because it's like I do, we're all contributing, but we have our different pieces to tr contribute. And we're very happy with that piece. I mean, I haven't done the dishes in six years. <laughs> Isn't that heaven? I've not done it because I love cooking and I love cooking. Right? And so there are people in my community that don't like cooking, but they like doing the dishes. And so that's what they do. And it's a perfect, like, it's a perfect way to work it out. And then <clears throat> I think also the main benefit for children of being in intentional communities is that <laughs> if you're limited to only two adults, and that's your whole worldview, because as you know, when you're younger, the two adults are your, that's your version of God, right? Anything they say must be reality. If you're surrounded by multiple adults, That means you're exposed to all those different types of perceptions. It also means that, like, if mommy's having a horrible day and is gonna, and you know how it just, it's gonna come out on the kids. That's just how it's gonna work. If you're out of alignment in that way, then the kid can go to the other parent or the other parent or the other parent. So they've got all of these mentors. And so they've got a lot of different things to pick and choose from. And what you'll notice is the children start to choose and pick the beliefs that serve them the best. It's like they've got way more tools in the toolbox. And as a parent, like, that's what you need. It's amazing to have the babysitter come in, like, once a week. Why? Because that's, like, a time that you get to regroup yourself, and then you're such a better parent after the fact. But what if that was a, a like, 24-hour-a-day reality in your life, is that the kid could go, you know, spend time somewhere else if you were out of alignment. So you really could afford to get sick. You really, I mean, that's, we were never meant to live in this type of a reality where, like, as a parent, you can't get sick. You can't quit your job. No. I mean, you, you can't afford the natural things that happen in life. Life's not going to just go perfect all the time. You know? oh, exactly. I may have two kids, 9 and 11, and the first few years were very difficult until the grandparents moved nearby, and it was, it's was been such a blessing. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we started to have a life again, and uh, and the kids love it. Uh, so the more, the merrier. And, they, and uh, that's, that's why I, I always believe in the concept of community to raise a child yes oh it's it's like that's what i like to joke people are like oh it's a theory that it takes a tri you know like a tribe to raise a child or it takes a village and i'm like it's not a theory it's a reality <laughs> have a kid you know but i mean think about that if let's say that we hate our parents right so your grandparents or your, their grandparents come to live near you now what if you hated those people but you couldn't afford to not have them there because of the fact that they pitched in The beauty of a community is that you're actually intentionally selecting the people that you resonate with. Mm -hmm. Feel good to have around. Like, how much better does it get? <laughs> yeah, I think it's so important, you're right, because so many relationships are a controlled relationship. When I, I think as part of our evolution, we only want to have heart-to-heart -heart relationship. We don't want to be in a relationship because we are forced to, because we don't have a choice. Uh, We, we want to cut all these cords and yes. we just want to do what feels good in, in the moment. So, uh, so then, uh, great to hear that. So, uh, so now, what does it take to build this intentional community? Uh, I mean, for every group of human beings to come together, I think it takes a number of shared values, knowledge and, and goals. I think what's great, what's happening with you, you put these hundreds of videos on YouTube. So I think people who resonate with your material, uh, I cannot say have a similar frequency, but they, they aspire, aspire to the same thing. So do you believe with the information you put out there, this is enough to, uh, to start uh, a beginning of a community where people would be able at least to have the same outlook about life? Yes. 
I do, and I, I think it's just the beginning, which is what makes it more fun. I mean, it's always going to continue to evolve. But I think what we have to think about when we're forming a community is compatibility more so than anything else, which is a, this is the, a, an issue. The majority of people who love the idea of an intentional community are also free-loving people who would just like to include anybody in the community. And the reality is it's a lot harder to get a group of people to get along than you think. So there has to be, already in place, there has to be ways to deal with conflict so there's a resolution. Yeah. You have to be very selective about the people who join because, I mean, intentional communities are a, a real great place for narcissists because they can just feed off of people. And if, they're, if those narcissists are unwilling to look at their own wounds enough to start healing them, then there's nothing the group can do. There's no rehabilitation that can occur. And so, and compatibility also has to do with lifestyle. I mean, if you want a kind of a community that's healthy and someone moves in who wants to shoot up drugs, that's not going to be a good combination at all. So it needs to be a group of, of people that come together and decide what that community is about. Now this is what makes me so excited about intentional community. Intentional community is not just a spiritual ideal. Like you don't have to be spiritual to think about this kind of stuff. There could be an intentional community full of med students and they know what kind of lifestyle they want to live. They know uh, like how to help each other with medical stuff. They would know what their compatibility was. Maybe it has nothing to do with spiritual aspects at all, but it's still an intentional community. So do you believe then that it would be very useful to build a, a chart? It's like having a membership. I mean, uh, the members need to agree to a certain number. Of, I wouldn't call that rules because we don't want <laughs> to, to have something that's too stringent. So there needs to be a certain level of flexibility. But at least uh, I feel the members should align on the main principle of the community. Yes. And so that at least if there is... Uh, a conflict, we can remember this principle and, and we have a tool to, to solve uh, these differences. Oh yeah, but this is another thing about intentional community. Everything is out front. That's the difference between like a cult and a community. In a community, what the community is about is at face value. This is where we are. This is what does happen here. This is what doesn't happen here. In a cult, you quite often wander into it and only then do you get to read the fine print, you know? Yes. That is not how it should be done. No, exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I can see in the cult they uh, they try to hook people through the relationship. Most people who end up in cults is people who didn't really have a family, so there is a huge hole, and they see people are nice to them. The sense of belonging is fulfilled, and when they are hooked, that's when uh, I, that's when you start taking uh, all the resources you can from uh, from these people. Exactly. So here's the difference. The difference is there's no conversion. There never should be a conversion to become a part of my community. Like, even if you advertise the community, it's almost like you, you have said what it's about, right? So you're not trying to pull them in. They want to get in. And so you're seeing, oh, it's all, what I mean by that is like the energy to be a part of the group has got to be on the part of the participant joining. That's the only way to guarantee that all of the members of the group are going to feed into the collective instead of the collective purely feeding them. Exactly. It's a, it's a two-way street, like that. Com completely. And it hurt me to see, I mean, some people have accused that you are a cult leader. I mean, I know you now personally, and there is, a, I think, uh, it's really the opposite of truth. Uh, you only have a, a few people you live with, and you, you, you help a lot of people completely selflessly. But I, I guess there is so much fear in this concept, and, and too, because of where you're coming from, if there is something you want to create in his life, it would be the opposite of what created so much pain in your life early on. But it's so interesting that uh, some people are getting at you with this form of accusation. How, how, what do you make of it? I think the people are very loose with the idea and the term cult because they've never experienced what that really looks like. That's, that's true, yes. And so it's, it's like, what can you do? You can look up what an actual cult is, you know, cult criteria. You can argue with the cult criteria. But, I mean, if people make their mind up about you, there's nothing that you can do about it. I think people are just afraid of authority, and that's the reality. Yeah. A lot of people are so afraid of authority that they're not really ready to examine the idea of an intentional community coming together, you know, as equal members. My intention was not to, like, start up a whole group of, like, tribes that only have to do with me. It, my idea was to get the ball rolling so that people would start coming together in groups that would support one another. In the world that we're about to walk into, that's going to be absolutely critical. 
And the way I see it, you, you're not really structuring it yourself. I mean, you're setting the intent, you're setting up the energy, and then there's people like me and others that feel yes. inspired and make it happen. So you're really working at a different level as I see it. Exactly, because I, I can't actually set it up for individual groups because only the individual groups themselves will know what kind of lifestyles they want to be living. The kind of stuff that I can provide, having lived in an intentional community myself and also because of the spiritual stuff that I have got access to, is things like, I, you know, I can, tell, I can teach people how to do conflict resolution. I can teach people how to make a, a coherent environment. I can help yeah. people be in alignment. And so that really benefits when it comes to intentional community. Yeah, you provide us with a lot of tools. So to make yeah, sure we can, we can grow. In fact, uh, I think uh, w one of the good things there was in my spiritual group was um, mindfulness. That's really where I, I really focus on being present. I mean, the concept of being present, to be mindful, uh, came through edges, right? But I think to, to really have this definite intent to be aware of what you're doing in the moment, I think is critical for any form of spiritual evolution. You haven't spoken too much about it in your video, but I know self-awareness is probably the, uh, something that's uh, at the center of, of your teaching and what you're doing. Can you tell me why you haven't put too much emphasis yet on self-awareness as a, as a moment-to-moment -moment exercise and, uh, and way of living? Because I see every single thing that I create as an aspect of self-awareness. It's like, I see it as... as just like it should be going unsaid because even if, if you're aware if I do a video where you're aware of this thing you've been doing that you've never been aware of before that's a form of self-awareness and I also know that you can't force anybody to become a part of the now when they haven't brought back aspects of their consciousness that are stuck in the past so I, I see a present moment awareness as a lot more of an organic experience mm -hmm. than something that you can force yeah, and so it, it could be a form of an escape because you can take it to an extreme where you're going to be stuck in your head and, uh, and avoid to do really sh shadow work. So, so in my experience, you, you, at the same time that you work on your attention and being present, very, very important to go through your karma and dive deep in the emotion. And, and the two have to run uh, parallel. Uh, but I think both are really critical in the spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, so would you see uh, uh, an exercise on being present as part of the chart of that intentional community? It depended on the intentional community. That's the kind of thing that I feel like people should get, should agree to. I mean, the, I, the intentional community should be run a lot like sanghas are run. Sangha is, of course, the word for like, you know, Buddhist groups. Mm -hmm. But they do a really good job of agreeing to certain practices which I think is a really good idea in a group. So, but I mean, like practices could be spiritual or not. A practice could be we're all coming together for dinner specifically on Saturday night. Yeah, that's a practice. So it depends on how spiritual you want your group to be. <laughs> yeah, you're right, and it's gonna depend on uh, people who are part of it. Uh, and to so be different level, I think in every uh, such a group you have a different circle, right? Uh, yes. And and uh, I think. You, I'm, I'm the same way, but you know, I want to take the most I can from this life. I want to. Oh yeah, but that's the kind of intentional community that you'll end up in, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because I think for me, uh, personal growth uh, is something that probably that I see critical at least in my form of intentional community that that I would see is we'll take any opportunity we can to to grow as a person and. Uh, when there is a trigger, we dive in shadow work, yes. we are excited about it. Exactly. <laughs> but that's the kind of intention community that you and I would like to be a part of. Yes, that's yeah, exactly. Um, great. So, uh, an area where we, I think you're so inspiring is in openness. I mean, uh, uh, when I met you on YouTube 18 months ago, then I, that's the time you started your blog. And I, I couldn't just believe what you were you are putting in your in your blog <laughs> and uh, Why? Why? I, I think it was so new and almost uh, revolutionary that you could expose the darkest parts of, of your life right on the web as you said for a spiritual teacher it could be like uh, a suicide but uh, I, I really loved it to tell you the truth I felt it so inspiring and 
and that gave me the courage myself to to be a little bit more out there, not to be as afraid of my own opinion and and how I feel. Uh, but I think this openness is something we're all looking for, and I think that that's probably why you touch so many people because you, you really don't hold nothing back. Yep. <laughs> well, there's no real, there's really no difference between openness and self-approval. And to be in a state of self-approval is to be closer to a state of wholeness. And the state of wholeness is the state of waking enlightenment. I mean, we use a lot of words to talk about things when really it's all like this. It's, we're all using different words for this concept of enlightenment, which is a state of, of waking awareness, like total awareness, the highest of perspectives. You can't get there if you're not living an authentic life. So like I would even dare say that some of the people who sit at the foot of these gurus are in a place that is closer to enlightenment than the gurus themselves that are trying to maintain an image. Oh, completely. In fact, it was fascinating to me because I knew the guru in my community very, very well. And there was so much corruption. And I could see how much he was lost. And then I had disciples that were incredible, uh, heart fully open, there was so much kindness, they were really doing the, the work and practicing the right way, but they were still, uh, uh, how can I say, really being very devoted to the corrupted guru, and it was working for them, they were actually progressing on their path, but uh, it was really fascinating to watch. So life is often the opposite of what it looks like it is, in fact. Yeah, and that's, that's what we're here to change. Yes. That is that is a state of separation, segregation, internally especially. That can't happen if we want to find the state we're looking for. Yeah. So. Well, that concept of uh, openness, I love something you said, uh, that you're an empath, and uh, I'm a bit of an empath as well, is for us to be as accomplished empath, yeah. it's about fearlessness. It's about yes. fully living in your heart, and uh, that's when we accomplish our biggest potential, and for that... Uh, we have to be fully open, like yep. uh, so much that nothing can really touch us because we are love and we manifest yes. love. So uh, that was the analogy of Jesus and the feet, wasn't it? Yes, yes, I and like uh, and you've been a great inspiration for me uh, on, on that. So, so thank you. You think people want to hear that one again? Because people may have not seen that one. Oh, definitely. Okay, so I had I have a lot of people who ask me how can empaths protect themselves from things because we're just you know it's almost like they take a, a victimist stance. Now what's interesting is is that I would consider like probably the highest empath that's lived on Earth to date to be Jesus. So we know the old story of him going into the leper communities and like washing everybody's feet, and the only reason he was capable of doing that is because he wasn't thinking about protection. At the highest level, the empath is the person who walks in a state of complete fearless grace with a completely open heart, knowing that that vibration in and of itself makes you immune. Yeah, exactly. Well, what a great teaching. So from openness, openness, let's talk about vulnerability. In fact, uh, that's something I've learned early in life is, is strong people, not, not weak people, are able to be vulnerable. Yes. And uh, why is it so hard for people to be vulnerable in society? Because of what we think we're going to meet with on the other end of that vulnerability. It's not vulnerability itself that makes us uncomfortable. It's the fact that we're afraid that when we're in a vulnerable state, somebody's going to take advantage of us. So we can't be open in the present moment because we're always like projecting into the future, thinking about how is this going to be used against me in the future. That's why, I mean, I, a person can't be open about themselves because, what, my boss is going to see this and fire me. Or I can't be open about this because they're going to think fill in the blank. Or, I mean, we've, we're afraid of the consequence so much so that it's the same as everything else in our life. We're, like, living for something we're panicked about that's going to happen later. And that lack of self-love as well. We don't love uh, ourselves enough. Yeah. And that's why we are so sensitive to uh, other people's uh, opinion. But... It's such a liberation when we can be vulnerable with one another and when we go through crap, say, you know, I feel crap right now. And, uh, yeah, it's awesome. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, that's really the base of authentic relationship, so that I don't try to pretend to be something uh, I'm not. And, uh, and, and, that, uh, and it, it really helps stopping this separation. You know, I think uh, we, we are not vulnerable because we, we, are, we believe we are separate from one another. Yeah, basically, and that's what makes it very hard for someone like myself. 
because of what I'm actually not even physically perceiving the separation that other people are perceiving. And so when people think they have secrets, to me, it's like, you got to be kidding me. There's no such thing as a secret in this universe. Even if you think you're keeping it from somebody else, on just one level above this, they are, it's their secret. I mean, that was the part that really liberated me when I, when I really came into the idea of oneness as a, as a practical living thing. My secrets don't belong to me. My story doesn't even belong to me. It belongs to everybody. It's everybody's story. So why the hell am I acting like it's mine? A joke you have, it's, it's hard to be your boyfriend because you can see their thoughts all the time. Yeah, so, so the boyfriend can have no secret for you, huh? <laughs> um, so let's talk about friendship. I think, uh, I th I think that's really something that's missing in our life. We have, we have a lot of acquaintances, a lot of business contact. But how many of us have really true friends? You Very know? few. Yeah. And, uh, and friends, to me, this is a form of unconditional love. When you have a friend, you don't expect anything because even in a marriage, a marriage is a contract, you know, uh, where each person has to do a specific number of things. But uh, you, you select a friend f for uh, no reason, just because you like them. It, it, it's completely experiential. So uh, where does a friendship fit uh, in the sp spiritual community or intentional community? Is it an environment that's going to foster friendship uh, at a different level? Yes. It fosters friendship at a, a level where it becomes also a lifestyle arrangement. Now, we, that can either be painful or it can be awesome, you know, because we, I mean, to come together in an intentional community, because it's a lifestyle choice, you are essentially agreeing to certain things within the group. And a lot of these agreements, which we might have with our friends, are unwritten. It's like if I'm going through a tough time, there's, you know, might be, you know, a hope or an expectation there that somebody is there with you. And that has to be an okay expectation, as long as it's agreed to, right? Yes. But I feel like friendships, the thing about intentional communities and living with someone, really, is that, it, is that your friendships go to a whole other level. Like you, if you, it's sort of the joke, if you want to really understand who you're dating, move in with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you but, see uh, everything and uh, that's why you get to complete uh, reflection. Yeah. Uh, no, nowhere to hide. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so for the purpose of international community, where do you fit uh, the work on oneself and the commitment to healing? Because um, we know a lot of uh, people are very resistant. I mean, we we always in life attract these events, sometimes that are painful, but we don't want to make the step to really dive into the healing. I think for people like joining the type of intentional communities we want to create, uh, they would need to have this courage yes. to, to take that step. Yes. But I think the, by the time that people know about intentional community, they're pretty much going to be there already. Yes, especially if they have the loving support of uh, people uh, around them. Yeah, because it's... Uh, but uh, this is the fun part. Like, and it, the good part of intentional communities we've talked about, right? One of the parts about intentional communities that's really, really painful is that you have about 100 more mirrors. Because you're not in a relationship with one person. You're in a relationship with however many people are in that particular environment. And so this is one of the reasons why I personally chose Intentional Community as a, a world-famous spiritual teacher is because I have a desire to make sure I'm in alignment, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have seen what happens when people who have any kind of authority are out of alignment. So by putting myself around all of these people who are on an equal playing field with me, who will call me on my crap, then I have an environment where I am not actually the top dog. And that's super, super beneficial because not only do I feel true support, which most leaders never feel, I also have people that are keeping me in check. And that is the kind of thing you have to commit to if you're going to be a part of an intentional community because it's like everybody's going to be mirroring your negative aspects. <laughs> so we have to be willing basically to accept that. But on the wavelength of what you were talking about, there is no greater way to heal, honestly, than just surrounding yourself with people that are that close to you. Well, I agree. And I mean... Uh... Like in the cult I was part of, 
when someone disagrees with a guru, he would eliminate, eliminate him. So he would surround himself only with people who could bow to him and do whatever he wanted. And uh, in fact, let's talk about that. Is why do these guru really fall? Because I think most of them start with a good intention, you know, helping the world, but then they get stuck into the power and maybe uh, there was some sexual frustration or may, uh, they, then they go into money. But how do these uh, spiritual people in fact fall for the trap and then, uh, 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 and then really completely lose themselves? I think it's because they get to a point where it's too risky to expose the aspects of themselves that are shadowy. Also, it's very easy when you've got worship surrounding you to just try to, to run it. away from the aspects that aren't worshiping you. Yeah, because I think every one of us is vain enough to believe a flattery, right? And uh, yeah, yeah. this is the difference. If you're going to become a spiritual teacher, I believe you have to fall in love with self-improvement first. Now, when I say self-improvement, I don't mean to say that there's something that's wrong about someone right now. Yeah. But I'm, your, your top commitment has to be to teach from a space of vulnerability. To teach from a space of vulnerability, you have to still be learning. But the majority of people, it's scary to admit that because you do lose people. I mean, I'll be the first to tell you. When you come out of the box as a spiritual teacher and say, guess what, these are my issues. It will be used against you later. And people will leave because they want a perfect teacher. You have to just let them go, basically, and bite, yeah. bite the sort of ego cookie and keep going on your merry way because you're, you've got to understand what you're dedicated to. And it's really hard when you get famous. It is really hard to commit to what you want and what you really are committed to and to stay that way because people will be pulling you in every different direction that you can possibly imagine and selling you on a million different things so you have to stay like single pointed focused on what it is that you really want the most for me I want the answer to happiness I can't do that if I'm in a state where I'm trying to delude myself that means I have to admit to all the aspects that are unsavory about me no matter how much it hurts yet and to me I think we have to be in love of our own heart because if we get stuck in the in the movie in the projection the our center of gravity is gonna go there and the flavor of how we feel second after second is gonna change radically so i think to 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 stay in that space is uh yeah i think we we have to be in love of this hard vibration see so this is the this is the benefit of having intentional community like, you're never going to be in alignment 24 hours a day. That's what we have to understand. And yeah. None of us, at this point in our progression, nobody, regardless of like how high and mighty and evolved they might seem, you're never going to be in alignment 24 hours a day. So if you have those reflectors in your living environment who are able to say you know, to you, look, right now this is, this is not good. I'm going to tell you why this is not good. And this is what I've been noticing about you lately. You've got to consider it. Yes. I, I, it's like having a mirror put up against your face. And so really what it is is that looking in the mirror is scary and it's really scary for all of us, regardless of whether you're a guru or whether you're a person who's following a guru. You've all got to be willing to look in the mirror. And so if you're not, then you're going to surround yourself with people who only mirror the positive aspects of you and never mirror the negative aspects. But that's not a real relationship. And let me tell you the honest truth, they get lonely in it. The ones who decide to do that, where they just surround themselves only with people who you know fawn over them, they have immense amounts of pressure. That pressure has to be released because it's like, God, now I'm carrying all these people. They're not carrying me. I'm that, carrying all That's probably why most of them become sex addicts because Perfect. that's the way they, they release the energy. Yep. They, they can't uh, hold it. It's, uh, it, it's, and at the same time, uh, I want to have your perspective there, but it looks like every time there is a spiritual group, uh, there is a specific vibration and I think it attracts in itself very dark entities. So it, it's almost mechanical. So that's why across history, I mean, even Christianity or all the religion we see, I mean, we, we, we saw what happened in France two weeks ago. You, you start with uh, uh, awakened prophets and then you just wait long enough and you have the darkest energy surrounding that, that teaching. It's almost a law into itself. Well, anything is a recipe for dogma if you've got people who want power and control. <laughs> I, I wish I should say fear. Anytime you've got fear involved in anything, you have a recipe for disaster. 
Yeah, so I think that's why it's so important to be vigilant, to understand the spiritual intentional community you're creating will be on the yes. attack by people, by specific energy. So yes. it takes a sense of responsibility from each member yes. to protect this collective, just like you protect your own child. And, yes. uh, and, uh, uh, and we have to keep each other in, in check. Yes. yes. And uh, let's speak, I mean, many of the communities we've seen uh, over time have been hierarchical, right? You have a guru on top and then everyone... That should never happen. Okay, this is the thing that we got to understand. This should never, never even happen. I don't, I don't even believe in like the Native American way of doing things where you mm -hmm. have a chief. That shouldn't occur. What it literally should be is a group of people who all fill in different roles. So we got to look at it more like a pie, and the mm -hmm. pie has these multiple pieces, and one piece is no more or less important than the other piece. So even if you have somebody that's in your community who's really good at organizing things, that doesn't make them the leader. It makes them good at organizing things. There should be nobody who gets deferred to. That's the real reason why I only live with a few amount of people right now. I, have, I haven't opened up my community to live with thousands of people yet because I don't want to be the leader. I don't want to do that. I've surrounded myself with people who are capable of seeing me as the person, as just another piece of the pie. And that takes the pressure off of me because I need that in my, I need that in my communal living space in order to just, you know, relax. <laughs> exactly. It reminds me of the concept of holocracy. So this is a concept that's become popular in the business community. Some companies are starting to practice it. It's basically they, they get rid of the concept of hierarchies. So in fact, they, they fire the number of middle managers because they believe everyone were finding their, their spot. And they were really putting forward the collective intelligence of the group rather than uh, you know the indiv individual control. So the, this is coming into mainstream, uh, so I'm, I'm really glad uh, you have the same understanding there. And so, so now, so let's say there is this international community that we build a few thousand people, uh, so they have a life, they, they interact with each other in a certain way, but what would be the contribution and how should they interact with the rest of the world? Because what I've seen in the cult I was part of, they try to isolate themselves from the rest of the world. They were the chosen people. Everyone else outside were lost, right? And uh, I mean, you, you know, you've you, you, you've been through that again. So how do we, do we make sure it doesn't happen? And on the opposite, and to avoid negativity from the outside world, how do we make sure we, we contribute so that people then will be inspired by what this international community is doing? I feel like you might have a better answer than even I would because that's an aspect that I haven't really figured out yet. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I mean, it's been on the radar. I, I think that the, what you're talking about is absolutely critical. It's just is the practicalities of that one I haven't really figured out yet. In fact, I, I want to bring back the uh, experiment from Osho Rashnish. He yeah. was one of the first uh, very well-known spiritual teacher. But what happened, uh, his community met the local community in Oregon very uneasy and then a clash happened and, and then it went downhill from there. So I think whatever you do, I think it's important because people are going to feel uneasy about what you're doing because we're innovating the way we relate with one another. So we, I think we have to cont contribute. We have to do something positive for them. O otherwise, we, 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 they're going to make our life more difficult. Yeah, I agree, anyway. and we have to we have to not convert people. Oh, compact. Yeah, yes. This is, I actually think the, the the Buddhist communities have been the best, mostly in the U.S., where it's like they exist, but they're not also out knocking on doors trying to get people to join, and they do actually contribute to community. So the community gets like a little like weirded out at first, but then they're sort of that peace loving neighbor that never causes any problems really, and that's a wonderful idea. I guess I know where you're coming from. I mean, being part of a Mormon cult. I mean, Mormons are one of the best to, uh, for proselytism, right, in the world. <laughs> it's part of uh, even uh, of the membership. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, we can use all these experiments as uh, as way to learn so that we, we, we do what... We have, to, we have to go in with all of the members, I think, understanding that it's not us versus them. And understanding also that people are going to have adverse reactions. I mean, this has been the hardest thing in my reality is that I, a lot of times when people make their mind up about you because whatever you're doing, you know, might trigger them in some way, 
there's a lot of people that can't be reasoned with, and it doesn't matter how much you try. So, I mean, developing a strategy for that type of person is something that I'm even, I don't know about yet, but I'm quite interested in finding out how to do this. <laughs> on, on that, I have a, a simple rule. Uh, is uh, when I am triggered, I mean, yeah. because people can be super nasty, but uh, he, they can be nasty and you may not be triggered, then you know it's their crap. But the moment you get triggered yourself, you know it's your crap and it's time to, to work on yourself. And, and then you have to thank them for being uh, your teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's fantastic. Uh, so now I think we went over a lot of uh, concept. So uh, practically speaking, uh, how do we do it now? I mean, uh, I think you have an amazing following on, uh, you, on uh, Facebook almost. 100,000 people. I think you're full, you're, um, these people are more outside of the US than inside the US. It's really global at, at this point. Uh, and maybe the purpose of this video is to inspire other people like me yes. to take a leap of faith and uh, try to create uh, something special. And, and then we can uh, share with each other what we learn and, uh, and, uh, and move forward. But uh, This is what I think. I think intentional community should begin in the heart and the mind, mm -hmm. meaning we should start connecting with each other and having these kinds of relationships and also regular meetings, whether they're online or in person, basically. We should be having regular meetings so we start to get the feeling for each other. And then the shadow aspects of the, of the dynamic will definitely come up. Yes. So you're already dealing with those. And then at some point there has to be like a, we're moving from a virtual reality or like a, a, a just a meeting together reality to and now we're living together reality. So if that's the case, then people need to come together for, in an actual place. So there's going to be a point where it's really critical for us to find actual locations to set up communities. Yes, exactly. I think uh, it's just a matter of time where it would come and that this would be a very exciting time. Yeah. <laughs> And then the mirror is going to go even tenfold at that time. Yes. <laughs> and the vibration. Because that was something very special when I live in, in mind. Is the level of synchronicity was just simply unbelievable. It's like yeah. uh, it's almost like you're on a different dimension. Yes. When you have all these people working on themselves in the same place. Yeah. Especially, especially if you're in a nice part of, uh, of nature. Yes. Um, that's fantastic. So, Till, thank you very, very much for your time uh, today. Thank you for being an inspiration for all of us. Uh, so, we are glad to continue this journey with, with you and, uh, and uh, co-create uh, a new world. <laughs> it's one step uh, at a time, one yes. soul at a time. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. <laughs>